Now let's look at a somewhat more realistic example for a minting policy. So the problem with our first simple one was that there were no restrictions whatsoever. So anybody can mint and burn that token. So it's a bit more realistic that only the owner of a specific public key is allowed to mint or burn. So you could imagine that that key is associated with some project or company and that basically takes the role of a central bank in traditional finance. So central banks have the right to mint or burn fiat currency and this is basically the equivalent that only the owner of a specific key is allowed to mint and burn. So I called that module signed and now we have an additional parameter here of type pub key hash and we will get a parameterized policy. In the previous lecture we talked about parameterized validators and this is exactly the same idea. So instead of just having redeemer and script context, we can have arbitrarily many parameters in front of that. And then for each choice of the parameters, we'll get a different specific policy. So the idea is that only the owner of this pub key hash can do this minting or burning. So the transaction that does the minting or burning must be signed by this pub key hash. So the implementation is simple. We just use the TX signed by that we have already looked at when we talked about the vesting contracts. So we check that the transaction is signed by this public key hash. So very simple change and we just for debugging purposes basically give an error message in case the signature is missing. And now we have to convert that again. And normally in the case of validators, I had the same type here. So the parameter type didn't change. So if I did it the same way I did it back then, this should not be built in data. It should also be pub key hash. And then if you recall, the trick was to use this apply code to actually apply the value of the parameter to get the actual fully saturated policy. In this case, I decided to do it a bit differently. So instead of really using pub key hash as a parameter in the untyped version, I'm using built in data. And the reason is that I wanted to respond to a question we got in one of the Q&A sessions, namely how to work with parameterized scripts, validators in that case, but also now minting policies uh, from Lucid or generally from off-chain code. And uh, I wanted to demonstrate that. And maybe I just don't know Lucid well enough, but I didn't find a way to use parameters in Lucid that have a different type than built-in data. So what I'm doing is I'm using built-in data and then of course to convert between the two. So this PKH is now built-in data, but in order to apply it here to the typed version, I need something of type pub key hash. So I use Plutus TX unsafe from built-in data to convert this built-in data into a pub key hash. So if this is the wrong format, if it's not really a pub key hash, then that will fail at that point. So this is now the untyped version. And these two functions I normally did in one step. So the compilation and then application of the parameters. But now I do it in two steps because I also want the version where the parameter has not yet applied because I want to serialize that to this to demonstrate how to work with parameterized contracts from off-chain code. So I just compile. This is now not yet a minting policy because it still has this parameter. So if I want to get a minting policy, I have to use apply code, like I explained when I talked about parameterized validators. And now here my parameters again of type pub key hash, but I need built-in data. So I use basically the reverse of unsafe from built-in data. I use two built-in data. 
So two built-in data of the Papier gives me built-in data, and then I can apply that to this code. So I apply this first parameter and add up with something of type built-in data, built-in data unit, to which I can then apply make minting policy script. So this is now a minting policy. So for each pub key hash, I get a different minting policy. And if we for a second forget this first function, so this is then what we have seen before. So I can serialize that to disk for a specific choice of pub key hash. And then I could use that in off chain code like in the first example as well. So I get a specific minting policy which is specialized to a specific pub key hash. And I can also compute the currency symbol as before. I'm just computing a, a file name here. So I put the actual public key hash into the file name just so that if you apply this to different pub key hashes, you end up with different files. It's of course not strictly speaking necessary. Now, in addition to that, I also added another function to the utilities module that can take arbitrary compiled code and serialize it to disk. And I'm applying that to the signed code. So this will now be script serialized on disk where the parameter, the public key hash, hasn't been applied yet. And then I want to demonstrate next how using Lucid and off-chain code, we can use Lucid to apply this parameter. So this is the result here. So this is now the script in serialized form where the parameter has not yet been applied. So this by itself is not a serialized minting policy. I first need to apply the parameter. And I'll show you now how you can do that using Lucid. So I wrote a Lucid script for that, very similar. So I started by copying the Lucid free script we saw before, called it Lucid signed. So the beginning is very similar. I again have this helper function to ask the user for the amount and set up my provider block frost and my wallet and compute my address. Now I want to choose the parameter for the minting policy to be my own pub key hash. So whoever runs the script, the pub key hash of his wallet will be the one that parameterizes the minting policy. So if different wallets run the script, they will end up with different minting policies and therefore with different tokens and tokens that only they themselves can mint and burn. In order to get to the pub key hash, given the address, I can use the function get address details provided by Lucid again that Thomas introduced last week. So one of these details from the address is called payment credential that gives me a so-called credential and then that has a hash. And that's the pub key hash that I'm looking for. So I log it. Now for the application of the parameter. So first I have to tell Lucid what shape, what type the parameters have. So this data tuple is because you can have more than one parameter. So we will see an example of that when we talk about NFTs. And in my case, the parameter is just a string. I mean, it is a pub key hash, but Lucid handles pub key hash just as strings. So I only have one parameter and it's of type string. And now in order to get my policy, I take this serialized version that we saw before that we created from the Haskell code. And now I use the Lucid function apply params to script. It's parameterized by this params type I defined here. And now it first gets the serialized script and then it gets a list of the parameters. So I only have one parameter and it's my pub key hash that I computed earlier. And I tell it the shape of the data. So that's this here. And that's it. So that's way to use Lucid to apply parameters to a script to get an actual minting policy. And as I said before, I didn't find a way to 
use that for parameters that are not of type built-in data. Maybe there is a way, but I wasn't aware of it. But this works. And then I can proceed more or less as before. So I can get the policy ID. I can lock it. I can compute my asset class, which is called unit in Lucid. I query the user for the amount. And now I construct my transaction. That's almost exactly the same as before. The only difference is that I actually now explicitly have to sign this transaction. Of course, I have to sign it anyway, or my wallet has to sign it, because I'm spending UTXOs from my wallet to pay for the transaction fees. But for Plutus to be convinced that I have signed it, I must explicitly add this at signer key here. And then as before, I sign the transaction and submit it. We can try this. And let me first maybe comment this line here, just to see that it's really necessary to sign it. So let's say 1 million again. And now I get an error. It says the provided Plutus code called error. And we see here missing signature. So that's the error message that we explicitly put into the Plutus script. If you recall, we use this trace if false with this error message. So if I don't explicitly sign the transaction, then minting fails. So the minting policy script complains that the required signature is missing. So let me uncomment this again and try again. One million. And now it looks as if it has worked. I can check in my wallet. It's not there yet. So we must wait until the transaction is on the blockchain. And there it is. Let's try to burn it again. And it is gone. So this was a more realistic example of a minting policy, basically one that simulates a central bank. So a central authority that is authorized to mint or burn, but only with the signature of that authority, minting and burning is possible. So this token we now had in our wallet, if some other wallet would run the same script to, to mint token, then it would have the same token name but a different currency symbol because the application of a different pub key hash to the parameterized script leads to a different script with a different hash. So different people can, can do this process, but they will end up with different tokens. Whereas in the first example, it doesn't matter who runs the script, who mints the token, it's always the same token.